introduce our, our first speaker, uh, Jennifer Ceruta. She is the assistant professor at the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, and she focuses her time on honeybee health, pollination as the state extension service, apiculturist. Her research includes honeybee foraging behavior, behavioral resistance to mites, genomic imprinting, and pesticide exposure. Now, a lot of them words I just said, I ain't got a clue what they are, so this is gonna be a learning experience for me. So Jennifer, we are ready for you to come on up here. Let's see, sorry, I'm a little bit rusty with doing things in person, so thank you all for coming out today. Um, I'll be talking about plentiful pollinators, and hopefully you all have been familiar with pollinators, you've heard about them a lot in the news, um, and, and their declines, but we're gonna talk about some of the positive things today, and what I'll be talking about is the importance of pollinators and what we can do in our habitats to try and to support them, even if we're not gonna become beekeepers, it's completely fine. I had a, a sub, subject line for this talk is called free range beekeeping. So if you plant the forage, let the bees come to you and they come and go and you don't have to take care of them. And you can just buy some honey, it'll be cheaper. Um, but we'll talk about a little bit of those benefits of keeping bees anyway. Are any of you beekeepers by chance? Okay, excellent. Well, not excellent, but in interesting to know. All right, we're gonna move on, but hopefully you'll see in this, um, these diagrams here that we have many different types of pollinators. And what I'm showing here is I'm putting an emphasis on insect pollinators, although we do have many different types of pollinators. Humans can serve as pollinators, but we also have different animals that serve as pollinators. And we'll get into that in just a second. But we just finished having um, National Pollinator Week in June, so we have this nice little graphic of all these beautiful different pollinator, insect pollinators we have in the world. All right, so the value of pollinators on your day-to-day -day lives, in case you are not familiar with this, is about one out of every three bites of food that you consume has somehow been impacted or benefited through pollination services by animals. So that other big chunk is due to things like wind, but you can see in these pictures on the Left-hand side is what your breakfast looks like with pollinators, and on the right-hand side is what your breakfast looks like without pollinators. So how many of you would want to eat the breakfast on the left-hand side versus the right-hand side? Okay, right-hand side versus left-hand? Yeah, I, I'm kind of carb-friendly too, but, um, and then some people probably skip and just don't even have breakfast at all, right? And so that's one of the interesting things up here is that it's not just about um, you know, breakfasts being impacted, but you can see that there are a number of things missing from these lunch or these breakfast plates. So not only are your fruits missing and your jam and your fruit juice is missing, but also you have the, the tree nuts missing, the almonds and that granola, um, and then also that creamer in your coffee. So are bees directly pollinating cows? Everyone should know the answer to this one, right? <laughs> Even some of you little ones out there. Right, no, cows probably wouldn't like that. It'd probably tickle a little bit. But really, it's through the pollination of the food crops that go, the forages that feed the livestock. So there we have an indirect benefit through our diet. So even if you aren't a breakfast person and you don't like fruits and vegetables, you can think about the impact on our, our, our larger um, livestock in terms of like a burger or steak up there being missing. And it's been estimated through some research studies that uh, about $29 billion, I don't know if that's showing up on your screen, it's a little bit cut off on this screen, um, that the value of the crops in the United States that has resulted from insect pollinators, it's about $29 billion. And of that, honeybees are doing about two thirds of that pollination. And just like everything in agriculture, it's a dynamic system. So some years will be up, some years will be down. So these are data from 2010. The year before was a little bit lower than that. Um, that was the last year that we had a big national study on this though. So usually though, we still see that same relationship with honeybees doing about two thirds of that pollination. So I, I, we talk a lot about native bees and they're fantastic too, but I just wanna point out that honeybees are doing the majority of this managed pollination um, for our crops. And part of that is because the foods that we eat are often foods from food crops from other countries. And so when we look at the, the food crops that are native to the United States, they're fantastic food, food crops, but clearly our diets are, consist of more than just those food crops. 
So we rely on a lot of um, different types of plant um, crops that come from all around the, the world. And that's one reason why we like to have diverse pollinators. And one reason why honeybees, which are not native to the United States, make great pollinators for a lot of these crops. They're generalists, they go all over the place. Um, they have a really large foraging range, which we won't get too much into today. Um, but just know that that's one of the benefits of them is that they will fly large ranges, whereas some of the native pollinators won't go as far. Uh, but this is just an example for why it's so important for us to have diverse diets, for us to be healthy, also relies on us having diverse pollinators. So it's pretty obvious, you know, we always think about fruits and vegetables in terms of pollination services for things like bees and why they're so important. So especially in our area, the southeastern region, or actually, I don't know if we're considered southeastern, um, say Tennessee specific. Uh, we have a lot of squashes that are grown here and a lot of berries that are grown here, even some apples that are grown that all need pollination services. They need something to move that pollen from the male parts of the plants to female parts of the plants. And in some plants, you have male and female pollen and then um, um, stigma on separate flowers or even on separate plants. So in the case of wind, that can sometimes move the pollen around. But these bees make really good vehicles for moving that pollen because they have really fuzzy bodies that that pollen is just attracted to. So we'll get into that in just a second as well. Some of the other things that are not as obvious and maybe not as intuitive is the value of these pollinators on things like oil production. So canola, which I'm showing here, this brassica on the left-hand side, um, because we use those seeds, we press those seeds to get those oils out. That's actually a really great crop for, for bees to be um, foraging upon. And then on the right-hand side is um, alfalfa, which again, mentioning the importance for forages for livestock. So lots of different um, impacts on not just our fruits and vegetables, but also on um, other raw materials there. And then it's also important to have pollinators in different types of um, landscapes, including natural landscapes. So this is, do any of you know what this flower is by chance? Strawberry, no. It's actually a, a pretty rare flower that grows in South Carolina in the foothills. It's called the Oconee Bell. And so it has a special pollinator for it too, and it only grows in a certain region and it only blooms during a certain time of year. So in those cases, um, that it's a really close relationship with their pollinators. Um, but also, we, we've served to feed wildlife as well. So when you have pollinators, native or non-native, out in natural areas, they're producing food for those uh, wildlife animals um, through the production of things like berries, but also through the production of more plants. And then, a little bit sadly, also themselves being the prey for a lot of the, the wildlife out there. Um, so lots of different impacts there. And I think hopefully this video will show too. So this is a, a plot I have out at one of the farms um, at, at University of Tennessee. And so I plant this for my bees, but also native bees. But hopefully you can see in the background that there are a lot of birds flying around too. So they're also feeding on a little bit of the bees, but probably some of those seeds from those flowers. Um, and then also there are a lot of um, butterflies and, and um, Lepidopter, le butterflies and moths that have caterpillars that are feeding around on them too. So that all serves as food for the wildlife. So it's a really nice, um, large supportive system. Um, those of you who have gardens at home hopefully realize the impact of pollinators too on your individual crops and yields. And so for things like, you know, homegrown tomatoes, you do need to have pollinators for that. You can have agitation from things like the wind, but even things like um, bees that are usually the larger bodied bees, um, that do buzz pollination. So I took out a slide on this, but bees that, prefer, that perform buzz pollination hold on to the flowers of things like solanaceous plants, like tomatoes um, and eggplants, and they buzz, they vibrate against that flower to release the pollen. So if you ever look at a tomato flower, it's not like pollen is just out and about. It's, it's held inside. And so oftentimes with these pendulous flowers or pendulant flowers, there's not pollen that's just dropping down. So that it requires a buzz pollinator to hold on to that flower, buzz against, vibrate against it to release that pollen. And so that's what you see. And well, maybe if you squint hard, you can see that there's a little native bee um, on that flower um, with the tomato plant. And so as I mentioned before, as so I've already talked about there being so many different types of pollinators, and across the world we have many, many different types of pollinators. And so you can see in this nice poster that it's not only um, bees and, and butterflies and birds, but there are also some mammals in there. Uh, there's some squirrels, there's some um, bats, there's even um, a non, um, 
actually, they actually have some hummingbirds in there as well, um, and also some lizards in there. So lots of different types of pollinators, but it doesn't reflect one of the big ones. And so especially out in more towards like West Tennessee, where you have a lot of more of the row crops being grown, wind is a really important pollinator to move pollen from, from male parts of plants to female parts of plants. But we do emphasize a lot the importance of animals on, on, in terms of pollination services. And then of course, as I mentioned before, the value of insect pollinators is huge for a lot of our fruits and vegetables. And so in this collage, you can see that there's not only bees, but there are also um, wasps, and there are also flies, and there are beetles in there. So anything that's moving pollen around can be thought of as a pollinator, but the really efficient pollinators are those bees and especially honeybees because of their morphological structures like being really hairy and then foraging on pollen and nectar purposefully as their food resources. So they have a direct connection with these um, uh, plant-derived um, resources. And so this is what we want to think about in terms of how we support these different pollinators is by having functional landscapes. So when you see this picture, what do you think? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs up? Hopefully, hopefully you guys understand where I'm going with this. Hopefully we're gonna change our minds and think of this as being thumbs up, right? Or at least leaving part of the yard at any given time with some of these weeds, right? And how we um, talk about terminology. Melody's gonna talk about some terminology later on too, why it's so important. And so for me, these aren't weeds. These are valuable um, pollinator food resources. And this was actually taken out in New York where I know a beekeeper out there who plants acres and acres of dandelion just to get a honey crop from it. So it all just depends on your mindset. And so hopefully today, we'll get you to, to see things a little bit differently when you go out into the field and not see this as yucky, but just see like, oh, look at all that pollinator food. That's fantastic. It also allows you to be a little bit of a lazy gardener, and that's okay too. So that's what I like about gardening for pollinators. It's relaxed. Okay, we think about that habitat too. It's not just the, the use of those flowers, but also for a lot of these pollinators, in this case, we're talking about a leaf cutter bee, they actually use the leaf material as nesting material for um, when they build their, their nests and they lay their offspring, they separate out the individual cells of developing bees with sometimes mud, sometimes um, ants. There are some bees that actually use ants to separate out their cells, but there are leaf cutter bees that actually make these really nice round cuttings out of your leaf tissue. And so this is just something to keep in mind too as well when you're gardening to think about, hmm, if I see holes in my plants, are these from good bugs or bad bugs? Because if this is a good bug, you definitely don't want to spray this plant with insecticides thinking that you're killing a, a, a bad insect. This is actually something that's good. So I realize it does make it hard to determine is this from a good bug or a bad bug. But you can see that these are nice rounded circles that are taken out of these leaf tissues. And then there are some other insects that, whose larval stages, caterpillars, are using the, the plant tissues as food. So not just the flowers, but also the leaf tissues. So how many of you know what, what type of caterpillar this is? Someone be brave. It's okay, they won't, the, the, their mics won't pick you up, so you can just say a wrong answer, sorry. Starts with an M. Monarch, yes, fantastic. So these um, butterflies, it's really important that we plant these food resources for them because they are um, really in decline across the world, but especially in the United States. So when we plant things like milkweed, um, we're, we're providing food resources for them. Although when they are successful plantings, they oftentimes look like this and they look really bad, right? So usually if I'm planting this, I plant this in my backyard so my neighbors don't see this terrible, what looks like terrible gardening because all my plants have bug holes essentially in them. But it's actually good because I'm feeding monarchs. So that's just something to keep in mind is that sometimes bad looking plants are because you're supporting pollinators out there. When we talk specifically about things like honeybees, there are different types of habitat use. So I already mentioned the importance of um, pollen and, and, and nectar, but in this case, I'm showing you some beautiful pollen that's diverse pollen. All these different colors are from different plant resources. And why we want diverse plant resources is because these different plants have different sets of amino acids 
that contribute to a healthy diet for the bees. And so just like us, even though we could get all of our nutrients possibly from one type of food, what's the chance that that's gonna be the only food we eat and that we're gonna be happy eating it all the time, right? So diversified diet is really important for these bees too. And so oftentimes when they're out foraging, they're bringing in resources from many different types of plants. They're also collecting nectar from flowers and bringing that back and then converting that into honey. But another reason why nectar is really important is because of the sugars that it carries. And so those sugars, when the bees consume high amounts of it, young bees especially, that results in the bees producing these little wax pellets. And so these wax pellets are, come out of these glands in their abdomens. I always tell kids it's like belly button lint, but better. So they use this to then make Oh, uh, sorry. They use this to then make that honeycomb, which, sorry, I don't know if I can show it out here, that wax there. So originally we just give them these flat sheets of wax or plastic just to help, help them give them a template to build from. They would build on their own anyway, but this helps ensure that they build the nice rectangles that we like. And then they, they chew on that, those wax pellets, make it soft and build that honeycomb so that they can store um, nectar in it, pollen in it, as well as raise developing bees in it. So that's their building block essentially. And they also use propolis, which is a really thick tree resin. So it's like a, a solid version of a sap. And so this is it in the colony itself. And they'll use this um, as a glue, essentially. And so in areas where I have lots of ants, they'll oftentimes use this to seal up all the cracks so the ants can't get in. But there's also some interesting research out of the University of Minnesota and some other labs too, showing how important this propolis is in terms of having some antimicrobial properties to it and maybe some antiviral properties. And so trying to increase the amount of this propolis that's in a colony is kind of a, a new thing to think about. So we actually try to get bees to put more of it, line their colonies with it. Whereas before, we were actually trying to like decrease the amount of it because it's just so sticky and it gets all over our hands and it's just a pain, but it's actually a benefit for the bees. So this is typically produced by a lot of our, our trees, a lot of like poplar trees. So it's not just wildflowers that are important for the bees, but also things like trees that produce not only nectar and pollen, but also the, this propolis. The other benefit about honeybees specifically is beyond honey. So they are honeybees because they are the, this is the species of bees that we use to produce honey for us in the United States. So it's not native to the United States, but it's a really valuable um, species. And so we use this honey for things like cooking and, and baking, obviously, but also for medicinal purposes. So you may not realize that there actually are some wound treatments out there that are approved by the FDA that use honey as an ingredient. And there are actually some, um, turtle sea turtle rehabilitation clinics in like the southern states along the coast that use um, honey wraps on the the shells of those turtles that have been um, cracked through um, exposure out in the sea so really cool that this honey certain types of honey not all honeys can have medicinal properties too and then pollen so we some people consume pollen um, i if you are thinking about consuming it though for for allergy purposes always talk to your doctor because if you do have a severe allergy you want to be very careful about how you intake pollen. So I'm not promoting this. Talk to your doctors if it's something that you are thinking about. But there are people who consume pollen. Um, and then the wax, of course, is something that's really valuable that we use in many different types of products, but especially things like candles and soaps and lotions. So another added benefit, another hive benefit that we get from honeybees. And then another thing that I didn't mention in the top one is, is mead. Have any of you had mead before? Okay, you've all revealed a little bit of information about yourselves. So this is fermented honey. So it's a wine that is made out of honey. So one of the nice advantages of it in this time and age is that it's a non-grain um, alcohol. So people who have celiac disease and can't have grain products, um, this is a nice alternative for them. It's a sweet wine though. But lots of different things you can get out of a honeybee calling. So I just want to point that out that honeybees are valuable beyond just their pollination services, but they are, we are very careful about where we place them in terms of the landscape. So if you're in an agricultural area, fantastic. More in areas where you're trying to conserve biodiversity of native species, we want to be a little bit more cautious about where we're putting honeybee colonies so we aren't impacting negatively those native populations. Okay. The other thing too, leading into Melody's talk, is how important these, these habitats are for specifically honeybees, but this translates into other species as well. And so these are just some examples. Our job in Extension is to promote science-based information. 
And so these are just some research papers that are showing the value of this habitat and these floral resources beyond just providing nutrients, just you know, nectar, having sugar from carbohydrates from nectar and proteins from the pollens. But there are these phytochemicals that are in both the nectar and the pollen that can help the bees fight off viral infection, help them deal with pathogens, and then even just having a high quality pollen diet, an adequate diet when they're young, having a, a really well-nourished developing bee as their little grubby looking larvae can help them deal with um, pesticide exposure when they're adult bees. So this is just something that we need to think about in terms of we're not just providing forage for the bees to make us honey, but that we're trying to make the bees healthier so that they can be better pollinators of our crops that then feed us. So it's a nice mutual exchange there. So Melody's gonna get into this a bit more, but talking about what to plant, everyone says, okay, great, great, I'm convinced. I wanna plant for bees, what do I plant? And we've gotta slow it down a little bit. Well, we really wanna think about first how to plant. And so do you have a site that's um, suitable for planting? yet or you know we can work on that but one of the, the key things to do is to understand the the property or the area that you're thinking about planting in knowing the history of it what was it used for before um, how will you prep that land is it you know what are you open to in terms of um, site preparation options some people don't want to use herbicides at all some are open to using herbicides some are fine taking the time to doing a smothering method that can take months but can be also really effective in terms of decreasing the amount of seeds from weeds that are in that soil and so that is something that we want to to try and think about is not constantly tilling up that soil and bringing new weed seeds that are layered in that soil back up to the surface where it can then germinate we will have an ongoing battle with weeds for decades if we take that tactic. So just be cautious about that. And then also thinking about doing soil testing. Is your soil going to support these pollinator plants beyond this one season? Especially if you're planting things like perennials that will come back every year, your site preparation is really going to be focused on that first year because once you have them in place, it can be really hard um, to site prep after you have plants established and they're coming back year after year. You can go in and spot herbicide, but if you are trying not to use herbicides, uh, or you can hand um, weed, but we all know that's a lot of work as well. And so that's why it's really up to, it's your advantage to do as much site prep in the beginning to decrease the amount of um, obstacles later on. Um, and then, of course, once you get your soil testing results, um, you can go ahead and amend the soil um, as needed. And so if you're unfamiliar with soil testing, you can go ahead and, and take a soil sample and take it to your county extension office. Um, we have little baggies there, to, or little boxes, these boxes as well. And so um, if you're in, in Greene County, I'm sure Melody can, can help you out with that. Um, and then they go to our, our diagnostic lab in middle Tennessee and then they, they give us the, the test results back so it'll give you an idea of what you might need to do to further your your soil health for planting these um, plants long term and then as far as what to plant Melody is going to talk a little bit more about the different types of considerations for um, natives and, and non-natives but here I just want you to think too about these pollinator plants there's so many different types of plants that can promote and support pollinators so thinking about what does your land, what, what is best suited for your land? Instead of trying to force, I want to plant this plant in this soil in this light condition, sometimes it's not a good fit. So think about what your land is, take an assessment of your plot, and then try to find the plants that are best suited for it. And so think about where you, know, where you are in um, Tennessee, where you are in the county, is it ag land, is it um, urban land, is it part of a yard, what do you want the aesthetics to look like? Do you have additional irrigation? Are you just relying on rainfall? Those will, be, those will have big impacts in terms of uh, establishment if you're doing things like seed versus if you're planting, starting out with some plugs. Um, sunlight, of course, plants, the, the two big things, right, are sunlight and, and water. And so paying attention to those needs of the plants as well, as in addition to what you have available at your site. And then pests. So, I have a couple sites where deer are a problem, and so I'm specifically looking for deer-resistant plants that I can put there. I want to support wildlife, but not that kind of wildlife, not all the time. So it becomes a little bit difficult, um, and I don't want to always be putting up fences. So if I can put up plants that prevent them from wanting to come in, from attracting them, that's my best bet. And then permanence. Is this going to be a plot that you're permanently planting for pollinators, or is it just something for this one season? 
that's going to determine whether or not you want to put in, invest the money in things like perennials, which why put in something that's going to come back year after year if you're just going to cut it down after a year anyway? And then a lot of the perennials won't actually have a, their, a, their peak bloom until year two or year three. So you won't get that out of the site if you're going to be planting it just for, if you know it's only going to be one year of establishment. And then, of course, the financial end of it, right? So you can get a bag of seeds for really cheap. You can get whole plants, established trees that are, or not established trees, but um, full grown trees that are very expensive. So it's all up to you in terms of figuring out what your budget can support in terms of what, what was going to be the best plan for you financially. And then what are your individual goals and preferences? So, you know, if we had beekeepers in the room, the preferences would be geared more towards producing or planting things that would support honeybees. And so there actually are different, some, some different needs nutritionally between honeybees and other types of bees to, to consider. And then also, if you are trying to support local bees, what types and what does that mean? Or even not even bees, if you're trying to support monarchs, if you're trying to support some other types of pollinators out there, there are considerations for those types of plants. And so one of the interesting things is there's this paper that came out that was trying to bridge the gap between, between um, wild bees and, and managed bees and trying to figure out well, what are the plants that are best for all of them. And so they looked at um, many different plant species. And so they found are some Asteraceae. So if you all know plants, asters is a, is a huge family. Um, but the goldenrods especially are really great and the asters because they're blooming late in the season. So that's one thing that we deal with as beekeepers is we have a lot of floral resources available in the spring and early summer, not so much in the early spring, late summer and fall. So those are really times that I target plantings that will bloom to support those bees during those times when we don't have as much nectar and pollen available. Um, and I just want to point out too that a lot of these plant lists that we come up with or that you see out there are primarily based on just attraction, not actually on nutritional value. So if you think for a second about what would your diet look like, your diet list look like if it was just based off attraction and not nutrition, those would be very separate lists, right? Unless you're a super healthy person. But those are really different. And so until we really do more research on figuring out what those nutritional needs are and what those plants are actually producing, we're not going to have a great plant list that really supports the health of pollinators. Sure, we'll give them enough sugars and, and food resources, but we don't know if they're quality food resources. So there's lots of research looking into this. Um, but I just want to point out that some of these great ones, as I mentioned, are goldenrod and some um, asters that are blooming late in the season. And then of the Laniaceae, um, here, this is mountain mint, so pycnanthemum. It's one of my favorites um, because it, it, it can grow as like a nice bush and it'll come back year after year. And it does support a lot of native bees and some wasps as well. It's usually just a buzzing bush and it smells fantastic. It's, one of, it's just one of my favorites that's out there and really easy to grow. Um, let's see. The other thing to think about when planting is the types of forage that you're having available across the seasons. And so I already mentioned early spring, late summer and fall are key seasons to have forage available. And you can try to plant successive batches of things like your annuals so that you can time when they're going to bloom. Your perennials, when they come back, it's going to be based off of mother nature. But those annuals, you do have a little bit of control there on when they're going to bloom. And then you want to have forage available all day. So one thing that you may not think about is that some of these plants run out of nectar and pollen by midday. And so then the bees and the other types of pollinators have to find another food resource. So we won't really want to have, again, this diversity of forage out there to help ensure that maybe they have some additional food available later in the day. It may not be their first pick because they may, they're probably going to go to their, first, um, their favorites in the morning, use all that up, and then they'll start going to their less favorite but still available foods later on in the day. And then if you are after pollination services, one thing to keep in mind is that if you want to have diverse pollinators, you want to plant diverse plants to, to support all of those different types of pollinators and to attract them into your area. And one of the key things is if you really want to help support native bees and attract them to your yards, um, then plant native plants. That's a really good connection right there is natives to natives. Um, and then trying to avoid some of these showy ornamentals that have been bred selectively for traits that humans like to see, like double petals, things like that. Bees are not concerned about double petals, right? They want to, they're going after the nectar and the pollen. And there are actually nectar guides on some of the flower petals and some species. And so we can't see them because they're visible on, only under UV, which bees can see, but we can't. 
So when we start breeding for some of these other traits that we like to see, we are oftentimes losing these traits that are important for the bees to be able to find their, their food resources. Um, and just a few references to um, support this um, idea that when you have a diversity of bees, you can actually increase your, your yields in terms of having increased pollination. And so this has been shown with sunflowers, this has been shown with blueberries, but also things like cherries and many other for these fruit crops, is by having different types of bees that work in different ways or just because of the way the bees interact. So in the case of the sunflowers, those, those bumblebees were chasing around the honeybees, so the honeybees were moving pollen around um, more efficiently. Maybe they weren't so happy, but they were moving pollen around and so they got higher yields. But then in the case of these blueberries, these different bees have different uh, propensities for things like um, how well they actually do the pollination, how efficient are they per trip. There are some species that are more efficient than others, but of course if you put out a box of 50,000 honeybees, you have that abundance, you have a lot of those bees available. So there are different ways we can um, take the best of different bees into a system and have increased pollination and increased yields there. And there's also this concern sometimes with farmers will say, well, I don't want to convert any of my land into area for um, pollinator habitat because that's going to take away, I'm going to have decreased yields because I'm going to be losing that land. So there's actually some experimental data that shows that when um, you plant this uh, habitat there, it not only, it doesn't draw the bees away from the target crop, it actually helps support the bees so that their populations grow and then you have more bees available to do your pollination services. So there's an increase there. And then another thing to keep in mind is, as a farmer, you can take advantage of this in terms of producing some seed that you can then spread around and share with others. So lots of great advantages to producing um, pollinator forage on your, on your farms. And the other thing, too, is that there is plenty of, of spaces that are not um, utilized in planting. So where you're turning around and you're not going to use that, that's, um, that land after you plant, throw out some, some annual seed that, you know, you're not going to keep it there long term, but you can get a nice little bloom, an additional little bloom there for the pollinators after that. Um, and then I just want to try and keep you all awake a little bit, just a few more little videos, um, just to show you, so different plants are going to have different types of pollinators that are really well tuned for them. So in this case, we're looking at four o'clocks, which are these flowers that tend to open at four o'clock. And then here's a manduka moth, and you can see, oh, maybe not. Wow. Well, the video isn't playing, then maybe I can just explain to you. Maybe you can see on this. She has a really long tongue, so if you ever see a butterfly or a moth, their tongue is just rolled up like a hose, like a garden hose. And so when they're sucking nectar out of these long tubular flowers, they're not really making much contact with those flowers. So they're not really effectively pollinating. In this case, with this moth, it's not at all. So it's sucking the nectar out. Versus when we look at this honeybee, she's stuffing her face into this composite flower head. This is either, no, you can correct me later if this is either like a zinnia or a sunflower, but it's this composite flower head where what looks to us like the center of the flower is actually all the individual flowers. And so she's sticking her tongue in and, and sucking up in there, and you can see that as a result, she's making all kinds of contact with that flower. And so she's coming into contact with pollen, and then when she goes to the next flower, she's stuffing her face into and moving that pollen around. And that's one of the reasons why bees are, are such great pollinators there. And so uh, Melody also mentioned that you guys talked about cover crops last time, and so I just want to emphasize how cover crops and pollinators can go hand in hand if you plant the right types of cover crops, and for many reasons. So in this case, I'm showing um, two examples, one being buckwheat and then one being crimson clover. The great thing about buckwheat is I, I keep some of my bees at an organic farm, and so we're not using herbicides, but if you do a high-density planting of um, buckwheat, you can actually use that as a natural type of, of um, weed prevention um, because it, sh it grows really quickly and it'll shade out the other weeds that, are, that would germinate. The other nice thing is that it produces lots of these um, beautiful white flowers that are abundant in nectar, and so the honeybees love it. Um, it's a really great plant. I don't love the, the taste of that honey, but there are people who absolutely love it. They're beekeepers, or they're actually um, up in New York, they actually love uh, buckwheat honey. So there's just different people who like different types of honey, more power to them. Uh, the nice thing about the crimson clover too is that the bees, and as you can see on that side, um, that the monarchs are actually visiting those too early spring when they're blooming. And so we can work together with not only improving the soil and our management of the lands by reducing the amount of herbicides that we're using, but we're also now providing food resources for these pollinators.
So just some nice little landscape photos of the um, buckwheat I have out in, in well, actually this was in, a, in another plot. Um, but here you can see um, there's a little honeybee in the center, but she's surrounded by this lush um, planting of buckwheat. But there's also support for other types of bees. So even though this is a non-native buckwheat, it is supporting, unfortunately here, carpenter bees, but it also supports bumblebees. Um, don't want to, to just think about, oh no, I'm gonna increase carpenter bees. Um, here we have a little native fly. We have a little skipper here. We have a wasp. We have a native bee right there in the center. And so just thinking about that, that these cover crops are actually supporting many different types of pollinators out in, in the yard. So really helpful. And even if you don't have farmland, you can use cover crops in small flower beds as well as a way to increase um, green manure in those plots. And I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because Melody is gonna be talking about it. But when we talk about wildflowers, it's a little bit different in terms of how we seed and what we're thinking about in terms of the mixes that we put out there. And so there are many different types of seed mixes available. Um, and usually they're a mix of annuals and perennials so that the annuals will be blooming the first year and the perennials will have time to grow and, and peak year two and year three. And a lot of the annuals that are selected for these blends will, will bloom year after year. So they'll reseed themselves and bloom year after year. So these plots oftentimes just only get more beautiful as years go on. Um, it is a longer term investment, so it tends to be a little bit more expensive than the cover crops. But it is something where you plant it and then you don't have to replant it. So that's one of the, the advantages of these plots. Um, you do want to make sure that you're using a carrier to help distribute these seeds. A lot of these wildflower seeds are itty bitty, like tinier than, than poppy seeds. And so um, you need a carrier not only to show you where you've distributed the um, seed, but also to weigh those seeds down so there's contact with the soil. Otherwise, they'll just blow away. And so this is another one of my plots where I do have um, a, a diverse mix of wildflowers out there. So you can see early on in the season, I think this was last year, um, as early as March, we had some of the um, canola blooming um, later on, April. There's a little bit of Siberian wallflower, if you see those little um, bursts of orange in there. Um, and then May, the um, poppies started coming up. So poppies will actually produce um, pollen for uh, pollinators, but not, not really a great nectar source, but it does produce that pollen. Um, and then May, it's really started to, to pick up a little bit more, had some delphinium, had some um, California poppies come up. I'm from California, so I want to put some of those reminders of home up there. And then there's actually a lot of different clovers that are coming up in, in this, the bottom of the plot as well. And so um, it worked out really well. It was a really beautiful plot, different things blooming at different times, which is one thing that we do like to see is that not only do we have different things blooming, but that we have consistent bloom across the season. So it's not just like one burst of, of food resource and then gone. Um, so I plant this in addition to those cover crops, which are just bursts, so that I have the best of both worlds. And so it's hard to see in this picture, but there actually is a lot of diversity in this plot, a lot of different um, flower species as well as colors um, that help attract different types of pollinators out there. Um, this is the site after um, the end of the season. And so you'll notice that it doesn't look fantastic, but I do leave a lot of the, um, the dead material around. The twigs and the leaves can be used by um, some of the, the nesting, the native bees that are using that as nesting material. So I do leave that um, there for them across the season. Um, again, two, two of my favorites that I have out there is that this clover is blooming um, just as a ground cover for most of the season, as well as um, the blanket flower, which is blooming across the season as well and attracts many different types of pollinators out there. So those are just two of my favorites. I also have this other site um, back behind the farm that's on more, well, it's out closer to my bees. And so I'm oftentimes trying to plant different types of flowers that can be used for cut flowers for our um, vol supported ag program or CSA, but we call it a VSA for um, UT voles. Um, so I'm trying to plant different types of plants that will be beneficial for the pollinators, but also be used as cut flowers. And so here you can see it was a late planting, but I took advantage of some um, rainfall that happened. And so just trying to see where the bees were going, what types of bees were attracted to different types of these um, plant species. Uh, and it did change as time goes on in terms of what was blooming where, and I did sub out some plants. Um, after the sunflowers were done, I went and replanted some other um, plants in there as well. But you can see that there's a lot of variety in color and shape um, and size. And so this was kind of a, a nice little um, 
plot study to, to practice on. And there I had replanted after the um, sunflowers on the right hand side um, some calendula. Um, and one of the things I want to point out too is when we look at these pollinator habitats, sometimes we'll look at it and we say, oh, we don't see many bees on it, or we don't see many honeybees on it. And we say, oh, that's not a good plant for the pollinators, for the bees. But really, you have to think about what else is blooming. Everything is relative to what else is blooming in the environment. And so if honeybees are out foraging two miles from their, their colony, they are, there could be a neighbor who's planting you know, five acres of buckwheat, and that's where all the honeybees are. But when that crop f finishes up, they're going to need another food resource. So even though they didn't feed on this um, sacred basil all season long, all summer long, um, it was only until October when they actually started foraging on it. So there are different times of the year where the, their other resources dry up and then they're going to forage on some of these other um, crops. And then, of course, I'm always trying to look for something that's UT orange so I can try and promote that in our flower baskets too. So calendula is a nice one. And I also wanted to point out, um, since we are in an area that has a lot of agriculture, that sometimes agriculture gets a bad rap in terms of having some practices that are negative for pollinators and bees. But this was a really nice study done at Ohio State where they actually looked at bees, looked at honeybees and where they chose to forage. They had this site where on one side it was um, urban and on one side it was uh, rural. And then they looked at the, where the bees were actually foraging. We can actually watch honeybees dance and see where they're actually going to collect food. And so when they looked at this over time, they could see that most of the bees, over the, the season, they were primarily foraging on the agricultural area. And why was that? This is a messy, it's beautiful, but it's a messy chart. I'm just gonna narrow it down for you. Basically, it's because there was a lot of clover and there was a lot of um, goldenrod blooming in those agricultural areas. So it's not because of the crops themselves, but because we allow so many of these other plants that in, in an urban area might be considered weeds and people are trying to get rid of, they're actually really beneficial. And so a lot of, more of those are being supported in the ag areas. The other thing to point out as I'm closing up is thinking about the um, way we manage these lands. So not only are what are we planting and how we're planting it, but how are we managing it? So hopefully we're practicing integrated pest management so that we're not just relying on pesticides, but we're also thinking about how we're decreasing pests but also promoting pollinators. So that's what the IPPM is. And the thought behind this is that ideally you're starting with a lot of preventative measures and some cultural practice, uh, practices, physical controls, and biological control, and then you're using chemicals like pesticides as a last resort. There's, they can still be part of your strategy, but you don't go to them as the immediate go-to because there's more risk there. And so for things like dealing with um, pest insects, think about number one, planting plants that are not going to attract pest insects, and so that's what I'm trying to show in this picture here is, the sunflower up on top is being completely annihilated by uh, pest insects, whereas the echium on the bottom is almost untouched. And so if I want to decrease the amount of the pressure for, to use insecticides, I'm going to plant more of that echium that supports my bees rather than sunflowers at this site. Sunflowers can be great in other sites, but not at this site. Um, so thinking about how we can use some of these beneficial insects for control and thinking below the surface too. We oftentimes don't think that we have this whole ecosystem below the ground. We actually have bees that are nesting in the soil. And so thinking about how we're treating that soil um, and how we're not only um, tilling the ground, but also being careful about things like mulching, not putting too thick of a mulch on the, the ground where the bees can't access and, and build their nests underground. Um, these are just, oh, sorry. This is just a little native bee that's going into a little nest box as well. And then, as I mentioned before, that last picture of that plot is the, how we create these habitats is management as well. And so I'm just going to go through this quickly, but you have it in your handouts, that how we keep these plants, we cut them back and you leave these stems, those serve as nesting sites for a lot of these stem nesting bees. They'll actually use those hollow stems to lay their eggs in um, with their, the, the next generation of offspring in there. So don't cut it all the way down. I know what we think about is, is aesthetically pleasing for us. Um, we like to have things neat and clean, but oftentimes what's best for the pollinators is um, slightly different. And so just think about planting your pollinator habitat. If you don't get into bees and beekeeping, completely fine. Have some free range bees. Think about supporting the pollinators by feeding them so they can help feed us. And so I wanna thank you for your time and your support. And hopefully you all have this last page too where you can find more information about my program and I run the master beekeeping program, as well as the, um, you can find your, your local extension office. So I'm going to leave it at that. All right. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Saruta? <laughs>
Here you go. Uh, you were, thank you. Good presentation. But um, do you have, uh, in these documents that we've got, do you have a listing of potential pollinator food that is uh, seeds and types? I saw Mexican this and I saw Ceruta or different, uh, excuse me. Uh, what seeds and where do we get them? And are what you've mentioned native seeds for native plants. Where do we find that information? So I just want to check. Melody, are you going over specific plants to plant in yours? So that's what they, we were trying to coordinate a little bit. So Melody will be going over some of those. Um, and oftentimes, um, you'll see a lot of the plants that are recommended in, as far as like ornamental plants will be more for like a home landscape versus farming. We have some different recommendations there. So if you're interested in more farming stuff, you can um, contact Melody and she'll contact me about what we can plant there. And as far as um, seed companies, we have a lot of them around the area. Some of them actually have ecotypes for different regions. Um, so Ernst Seed has ecotypes, but there are also uh, Roundstone Seed is up in Kentucky. There's um, also Applewood Seed out in Colorado. There are so many different companies that are coming up with seed mixes. So again, it kind of comes up with, or you have to consider what your own philosophies are. Do you want to buy something that's a little bit more locally oriented or ecotypes that match this region versus buying from further out in other states? Yeah, welcome. Any other questions? Any more? I have several grandchildren. I would love for them to get involved in this sort of uh, activity as Fantastic. we go forward. Um, do you all offer programs for young people through the extensions? Um, I have a set that are in Knoxville, but I also have several in this area too. Fantastic, so we actually have a 4-H program that's across the state. So Melody's in this county. So Melody, can you speak at all to um, who they should contact regarding 4-H? I don't know if you have a 4-H appointment. Uh, Holly Powell. Holly Powell. 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 Holly Powell. And so we are working on, we actually have a whole section on entomology and beekeeping. And so we're working on developing that. We, we just started reorganizing our outcome indicators. So hopefully we'll get more into plantings as well. So we can get them outside, which is fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Um, will the University of Tennessee be getting in, involved in the Heroes to Hive program for veterans? Um, probably, well, at this point, no, because we have the master beekeeping program. And that one is open to everybody. And so what we've been telling people that are, the veterans that are interested, is that our program is, is open. We really are interested in diversity and inclusion. I'm actually on my department's diversity and inclusion committee. And so it's open to everyone and there's um, inclusivity. We wanna hear everybody's, um, I guess, perspectives on why they keep bees and all that. But it's a separate organization. Okay, anybody else? Did you have a question? Yeah, but it might. Oh. Okay, so I just cleared with Melody this question. <laughs> um, so my question is, you mentioned that poplar is a good source to increase uh, propolis production by the mm -hmm. bees. Um, at one, I want to clarify that you mean the genus populus, and two, uh, are there other plants that specifically would I increase this? Yeah, so it, it depends on your region, but I think in this region, the, there's actually um, a new, USDA researcher in Mississippi who's like a propolis expert and so I've been talking to him to try and find out what plants in the south that he would recommend. So he's actually from the north and I'm from the west and so we're trying to work on that. But um, yeah, the populous trees around here are definitely um, a, a benefit but we're still trying to figure out what some of the other plants are or the other, especially trees that are beneficial in terms of producing propolis. So we don't have an answer yet but hopefully we'll get there. Great, great question. Okay, anybody else? All right. Thank you so Doctors, much for your time. Thank you so much.